the Chaldean oracles for tonight. It should really be called the oracles of Zoroaster, Babylonian Zoroaster. Said to be the uh, oracles that we're going to look at tonight are said to be from Julian the Theurgist and somewhere around the second century AD or the Common Era. Now, why, in, why go through the exercise of reading, studying the oracles? Well, several reasons. One is, it pulls together three things in a very nice way. The Platonic tradition, Hebrew tradition, the Kabbalah, and of course the Zoroastrian tradition. Now, where did the Kabbalah come from? It's got a long history, and it's very many. Commentaries try to argue it comes from one place or the other. Some want to argue that it comes out of Judaism, but there are many interesting books that have been written recently about the subject, and it looks like it comes out of a Neoplatonic tradition. I'd like to introduce you, therefore, to this work on the Chaldean oracles set down by Julianus, because in this book he argues and sketches out the likelihood of the Chaldean oracles being the source and the similarity between the Chaldean oracles and the scheme of their thinking and the Kabbalistic scheme is worked out in tables. So uh, it's interesting in that respect. But I'm not going to spend any time on it. I just want to let you know that it exists. I'm interested in exploring what these people were doing in this region Babylonia, the Zoroastrian tradition. Now, the only reason I'm doing it is because I enjoy it. <laughs> I don't have any other purpose. <laughs> but in doing it, it goes further in this area that I like to explore, which is, can there be a metaphysical, can there be a metaphysical cosmology? Can you have a view not of the physical manifestation of the universe, but an intellectual? What are the categories, what are the ideas that would be required for the universe to proceed? That's what I call a metaphysical cosmology. Now, just to get you into what these oracles are, I'm going to be using the Thomas Taylor translation and um, he breaks it up into several sections, and the first section is a straightforward metaphysics. The second section deals with what is called the intellectual, and therefore let me just read a bunch of them and you'll see how nice they fit together. The immortal depth of the soul should be the leader, but vehemently extend all your eyes upwards. When they talk about that expression, extend your eyes upwards, that's the Gnostic powers of the soul. And the depth of the soul is called the summit, the flower, sometimes called the hyparxis. And we're going to run into this several times, the flower of the soul. Hyparxis, it's the fullest, it's the fullest flowering, fullest flowering of the soul. Sometimes it's called the summit, the highest peak of the soul's range. Section 
seek paradise. When you behold a sacred fire without form, shining with a leaping splendor through the profundities of the whole world, hear the voice of fire. By extending a fiery intellect to the work of piety, you shall also preserve the flowing body. By extending a fiery intellect, that's an intellect full of divine light, you'll also preserve the flowing body. The Father perfected all things and delivered them to the second intellect which the nations of men call the first. And the Father perfected all things. Right? That's chronos. Right? Father of all things. Chronos. Right? the father of all things. Kronos perfected all things and delivered them to the second intellect, Zeus. Second intellect. Which the nations of men call the first. Men often call Zeus the first. But this is called the second intellect. Now, Look here. Same triad, basic fundamental metaphysical triad. Being, power, mind. Basic model. Kronos, Hera, Zeus. The substance, the power, the mind. Kronos is said to be the father, the source of it all. Therefore, Zeus is said to be the second intellect. And Zeus, of course, the goal of Zeus is to go in two ways, to return and to promulgate whatever it is down into the next region. That's the basic pattern of all metaphysics. It's basically a mean analogy. Basically a mean analogy. Right? A is to B as B is to C. Right? Two is to four as four is to eight. Kronos, Kronos is to Hera as Hera is to Zeus. A is to B as B is to C. Placed as a triangle called a trium. It's the furies that are the bonds of men. The paternal intellect disseminated symbols and souls. The father intellect. See, he is going to disseminate symbols in the souls of men. All right? In the souls of men. Here are some souls. All right? The symbols, he dispenses the symbols in the soul of men. And the symbols of all the divine natures, of course. The soul, being a splendid fire, the soul being a splendid being a splendid fire through the power of the Father, the source, remains immortal, is the mistress of life, and possesses many perfections 
of the bosoms of the world. The soul, okay. Put soul here instead. Put power in the second. And put the source of it as the summit. The soul being a splendid fire, so the soul now is a fire, a splendid fire, through the power of the Father, through the power of the Father, Hera, through the power of the Father, that's the Father, power of the Father is Hera. Remains immortal, is the mistress of life, possesses many perfections. The Father doesn't hurl forth fear, but infuses persuasion. Right? There's no fear in the model. The father has hastily withdrawn himself, has withdrawn himself, but has not shut up his proper fire in his own intellectual power. After the process, after the overflowing, after the overflowing, there's said then to be a withdrawal, and therefore the highest term remains in itself. Right? But in the overflow, it gains a power and a livelihood, pardon me, a liveliness and a vivacity. And that liveliness then turns around, turns around seeking its own source. Seeking its source presumes it must have a mind. And therefore, we have a unity of the three, which repeats itself again and again. The father has hastily withdrawn himself, but has not shut up, shut up his proper fire and his, and his own intellectual power. And the father, of course, Kronos, the summit of the intellectual order, is perfectly separated. I'll right, give you another one. There's a certain intelligible which it, be, which it becomes you to understand with the flower of the intellect. Ah, now look here. The highest term must be the source. We have three terms now. Intelligible means it must have some kind of being, right? right? Then there must be something, therefore, that can function and turn around and seek its source. That's the intellect or intellectual. Ah. If there's an intelligible, therefore, there's going to be a joining of these two, because that's the middle term. There's going to be a joining of these two, and therefore, this is called the intelligible intellectual. Intelligible means what? It has being. The combination intellectual, intellect, intelligible, intellectual means it must have power. It must have power in order to produce the pure intellectual or the intellect, which in turn must seek its own source, the intelligible. It's always the same. There is a certain intelligible which it becomes you to understand with the flower of the intellect. Well, the flower of the intellect, the flowering of the intellect is when the in, the in the soul of man, in the soul of man, when the intellect therefore can function totally in its capacity to see its own source. That's the flower of the soul. That's the hyparxis of the soul. That's the fullest flowering of it. There's a certain intelligible which you becomes you to understand with the flower of the intellect, which is the only thing that can grasp it. It becomes you to hasten to the light and the rays of the Father, whence a soul was imparted to you, invested with an abundance of intellect. All right. It becomes you to hasten to the light and the rays of the Father, Whence a soul was imparted to you. That's where a soul was imparted to you. Invested with an abundance of intellect. All things are the progeny of one fire, one divine nature.
Ah, the earth from beneath bellows at these as far as to their children. From the, no matter what happens to us, there's always the, that influence of providence all the way down into Hades. You should not increase your fate. Right? Don't add to it. Nothing imperfect proceeds according, right? Nothing imperfect proceeds according to circular energy from the paternal principle, right? It's all perfect. Nothing imperfect proceeds from that. Okay. Now, um, this whole section of the Chaldean oracles, therefore, is called an exploration of the intellectual, the intelligible intellectual realm. That's what it's called. All right, what are we going to do? We're going to explore this one realm through the Chaldean oracles that has as the reputation an unpacking and an understanding of what is called the intelligible intellectual realm. Well, we can also call it this way. We can say mind one, mind two, mind three. As long as you know it's functioning in the way in which we just described. Therefore, the second mind must contain what it does so that it can then overflow itself into the third. Now, let's take a look now, if we can, into how this functions. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Father, power, mind. Everything proceeds from the Father. Everything is measured by the Father, the source of all. The flower of the mind, according to the oracles, and I want to read a couple of sections from it, the flower of the mind is that moment when the mind then can then grasp the source. How can it do that? It does that because of one idea, which they repeat often, the idea of likeness. And we talked about that last time. Two words, likeness and sympathy. Ah, because in the flowering of the mind, the opening of the mind, it joins and assimilates to the source, its own source, and that's the summit of the mind or the first mind. Now, what do we mean by these terms? Now, I'm going to see if I can put ideas in there instead of these notions. Let's do that. One. The one. Sometimes called the good. Now, in the system we're in, the first thing you can say, metaphysically, if one, is oneness. That, in this game, gets a special name, Hina. Right. Which is just a fancy word for oneness. Now, what is this oneness? It contains two basic ideas. Limit, because it is an idea. Right. Limit, oneness, it's, it's describing something. Um, but yet it's open, unlimited. Now, those are the two fundamental ideas that proceed and that we can use to account for the metaphysical cosmology. Now, 
what are we going to call on? You know what we're going to call on? The intelligible. Now, what can we say if we have limit and unlimited? What's the next kind of categories we can get? Let's put it figuratively. If God's creating the universe, right, what are the first set of ideas he needs to proceed with? Oneness. Right? He's a one. God's one. Must be a oneness. What's, what's involved in the idea of oneness? Well, we said limit and unlimited. Uh, from the idea of limit and unlimited, what can we say? Well, we can say this, I think. Limit can be said to be a one. Unlimited can be a many. Because unlimited is a manyness. Limit is one. So therefore, from these two things, you know, you get, you generate number. Now, it does contain the idea of limit and unlimited, so we should call it intelligible too, but it's not just intelligible because they are a set of ideas that came from it, so we're going to call it intelligible intellectual. You know, if we have the idea of limit and unlimited as basic terms, and from that we have one and many, <clears throat> from which then we can say we can derive the idea of number, or therefore number is possible in our universe, Don't you see a one, I mean, the, um, there are a bunch of chairs here, a bunch of books. You know, I bet everything in the universe can be compared with everything else in the universe. I bet everything in the universe, but you can take anything in the universe, whatever it may be, and compare it with anything else in the universe in terms of just, if you can find anything the same or well, a matter of fact, isn't that not likely that everything in the universe must be the same in some respect and different in some other respect? That no two things are exactly the same in every respect, or there'd be one. So that no matter what we're talking about in the whole universe, it does make a difference what it is. I'm going to say anything about it. We're going to find something about it when we consider it in any way in terms of same and different. Or another word for different, by the way, is other. And uh, other, other, other and otherness is a kind aspect of <laughs> many. And one you know, a bunch of chairs that have something in common. I mean, one, one, one to it, doesn't it? I mean, there's something about all the chairs that must share something about it. Each one is a one, kind of reproducing one many times. So you know what? These two ideas seem to flow from those two. Well, if that's the case, we're, we're now in the realm of comparison. We're, we're in the intellectual realm where you're making all those comparisons. So we'll call that the intellectual realm. Now we can put in a lot of other things, but look here, we might be able now to set out We can now say, I wonder whether we can talk about limit and unlimited. All the ways we can talk about limit and unlimited and how it relates to oneness is going to be how you go from one to, that's a cosmology, how you go from one to the other. See?
the intelligible, let's try it this way. Uh, God of the one, even, even the very possibility of creating a universe, I mean, even the possibility of it presupposes something other. And yet, it can't be totally other than the nature of God. I mean, there must be something the same in respect to it. So look here, in the realm of God, therefore, if God is going to generate the universe, there must be something he reflects upon as a model. And on the basis of that model, generates the universe, or the cosmos. So therefore, there has to be something the same between the two, uh, similar. Can't be exactly the same, can it? Because that would be God over here too. Similar. Oh. But would you not agree to talk about similar You moved away from same. I wonder if we can make that clear. I bet we can. Look here. An artist, a maker, God the maker, as a maker artist, needs a model to in creating a copy so too The maker of the universe, the, what we call the demiurgos, maker, maker, God, God maker. So too, the God maker of the universe needs a model. He must turn to himself and use himself as a model. Therefore, in the mind of God, he must look to his, the source of himself for this model. Oh, the model, therefore, must be Uh, an idea in the mind of God. That's going to be the model. Hmm. Now, we want to talk about same and similar. Well, let's push this one more step on a simpler level. All right. If a shepherd is to his sheep, all right, as a ruler is to his subjects, the way in which a shepherd relates to his sheep, he's going to guide them, he's going to protect them. Now, will the ruler guide his subjects? Yes. Will he protect the subjects? Yes. In the same way? Well, if so, then the ruler needs a dog. That doesn't make any sense. Therefore, it can't be in the same way. It must be in a similar way. So therefore, when we look for, explore the idea of same, everything is the same as something else and other than itself. See, these two belong in the same class, don't they? These two belong in the same class, but when we compare them then, we compare them to see if they are similar. Ah, not same. Would you not agree then that in order for the universe to be produced, in order for the universe to be produced in this way, there has to be the possibility, there has to be the possibility 
there has to be the condition for likeness. For if likeness were, would be impossible, then the artist can never produce anything at all because the artist must go from a model to a copy. Ah! So the primary and supreme originating principle of the entire universe is likeness. Oh, well, that followed from same, didn't it? We, further distinction from, from same to similar to likeness. Oh, well, then now we're developing a whole set of ideas that we can talk about in this intellectual realm. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Now, the idea for creation in the mind of God, that's only one idea. That's only one idea. Everything else fits into it. Only one idea. Because the universe is one. Oh. Well, then, that one idea in the mind of God, that's an idea that belongs in the intelligible realm because that's the source of it. Ah. All right. And to produce it, right, it must be one as this must be one. Oh, that's an intelligible intellectual idea. That's where that comes from. Oh, and now to talk about it in the way which we are, we saw how all of these ideas fit in the realm we're calling the intellectual. Now, Chaldeans call that first mind, second mind, third mind. Functions in the same way. Functions in the same way. Now, let's see if that's the case. Now, I'm going to read from the... Um, Chaldean oracles, and let's see whether it fits into what we've been talking about. Now, an, uh, another word for um, primary idea, primary basic fundamental idea, um, is a monad. Fundamental, basic idea from which everything else is generated. Now, would you agree that in what we've been doing so far, this is an analogy. We express this as an analogy. So a basic monad can be analogical, can be an analogy. That's a basic monad. It's that one idea which generates all of its other members. That's a monad. So, let me get... Ah. Father begotten light. All right. Father begotten light. This is the boundless luminosity. Father begotten light, from this alone, by plucking abundantly from the strength of the Father, strength, power, that's the second, would you agree? Right. The flower of the intellect is enabled by intellection to impart a paternal intellect on all the fountains and principles together with intellectual energy and a perpetual permanency according to an unsluggish revolution. That's a big load, isn't it? But would you agree we have all the terms? Father, begotten light, right? From this alone, by the strength of the Father, remember our basic, basic triad? Source, power, active, or activity, or return. Father begotten light. 
plucking abundantly from the strength of the Father, power, strength of the Father, the flower of the intellect, the flower of the intellect is enabled by intellection to impart, to impart an intellect to all the fountains and principles. Therefore, from this life, from this power, from this, which is the flower of the intellect, there then flows all the fountains and principles together with all the energy. So therefore, from this comes all the principles that's going down. All the principles. Well, this either goes down or it returns to its source. Now, this second, this second is also called eternity. Now, what does eternity mean? Okay, in this game, eternity is a very central notion. Let's see if we can give it, all right? See this idea, idea in the mind of God? Consider this. All creation, all the change, all the evolution of life is nothing other than acting out what was in that seed, the first idea. Right? First idea is a seed. That's really what we're dealing with, right? It's just one idea, it's a seed-like manifestation of that one idea. Now, uh, what must that one idea be? Well, it must contain everything, mustn't it? All together, at once, totally, nothing, ma m nothing missing, nothing lacking, eternity. That's the idea of eternity. That is what eternity means. Simultaneous whole, where everything is brought together into a unity in a seed-like form that can then unfold in the processes of creation. That's what eternity means. See, time is a moving image of eternity, according to Plato. For eternity, according to the oracle, is the cause of never failing life, right? That's life, the second one is life, that's right. For eternity is never failing life. Unwearied power, energy, that's right. Fits, doesn't it? Exactly what it should be. So therefore, when you have, when you have this image of unfailing life, power, energy, all together, one, simultaneously, that's the word eternity. Because it's all there in its totality, seed-like, that's eternity. The extremity, the end, the extremity of the intellectual order, intel, pardon me, the extremity of the intel, intelligible order. I want to talk about it, here we go. Um, I'm going to read several things and it's going to take me something to pull this together, right? The first one is, they have the idea of leaping. Now, here we have, here we have the idea in the mind of God and the way in which these ideas therefore are infused or brought into the cosmos they use the term leaping. Right, it's got a vitality, it's got a power. Right? So, and it extends therefore to all things, down, down through all creation. Let's try it this way, look here. Would you agree that you cannot see without being able to distinguish what you see? Right? And whatever you see is a one. Huh? and a many and when you see it you can then quickly say whether it's the same or other than other things or in what way they're the same in the other that's what you're doing all the time so therefore even down to the physical into our physical existence these metaphysical ideas proceed all the way down into creation they proceed downwards for all things hence 
begin to extend their admirable rays downward, proceeding downward. But itself, the source of it, the source of it, it itself doesn't move, nor has it proceeded. It abides in its paternal profundity. And here's a major idea for most of this work. Right? It abides in a divinely nourished silence. So the idea of the mind of God is in silence. Therefore, one of their repeated spiritual techniques is silence is the way to the divine. Let everything fall into silence. Silence is the key concept in Neoplatonic thought as a spiritual activity or practice. Who first, who first leaped forth from intellect, clothing fire, bound together with fire, that he might govern the fiery craters, restraining the flower of his own fire. Right. Who first leaped forth from intellect. What's the first thing that leaped forth from intellect? What's the first thing that leaped forth first from intellect? Clothing fire bound together with fire, right? Clothing fire bound together with fire, right? And restraining the flower of his own fire. All right, I'm going to push that one more step, a couple more steps. Now, um, there are three terms he uses. And you have to know, before I read this to you, what he means by this one word. It's caused a lot of problems, but not when you understand it. Being able to assimilate, the, the being able to assimilate, right, what does that mean? Being able to become like the same one. The power, right? That desire to assimilate, to become like the same, the one. That desire within us to return to the one, to assimilate to our source, they call that, this curious word, faith. It's not a theological, it's not a theological thing to believe. All it, what it is, is this idea that there exists in all of us a desire to assimilate, to become like, to become the same as the one. So three ideas come together now. Faith, truth, love. All things are governed and subsist in these three. Faith, truth, love. Look here. Because... Because, look here, the goal, the goal of this, putting it back where we were a moment ago, if the goal in this case is divine luminosity, right, that is, in Plato's thought, called the perfection of beauty. That is, when encountered, it is not only experienced as bliss, but it's the perfection of beauty an overwhelming encounter with beauty. Well, therefore, if anyone catches a glimpse of it, it awakens the desire for it, and the desire for the beautiful is love. And since, since when you grasp that, it naturally follows that you wouldn't even go close to it unless you saw it at the same time as good, to see the connection between the good and beauty is a definition in Greek philosophy for truth. That's truth. Truth is to recognize that the nature of reality is beauty and experienced as bliss 
and recognizing that it's the source of goodness. Those three things together, that's what they mean by truth. You may conceive that all things act as servants to these three principles, faith, truth, love. The oracles show that the orders prior to heaven are ineffable and they possess mystic silence. The oracle calls the intelligible causes swift and asserts that proceeding from the Father, they run to him. Ah, same thing. Proceed from, run to him, return to him. That's the source. All things subsist together in the intelligible world. Now, hyparxis. What do you mean by hyparxis? The fullest development of anything. The fullest, most complete development of anything that anything is capable of achieving is a hyparxis. That's why it's often called the fullest flowering, the summit. Now he's going to talk about the hyparxis, power and energy. What the Pythagoreans intended to signify by monad, monad, the one, duad, limit, limit and unlimited, and triad, the way they can be arranged in this tri triangle or mean analogy of Plato, by bound, by infinite, infinite's another word for unlimited, by bound, by infinite, and that which is mixed from both, or we in the former part of the work, by one, the many, the united, that the oracles of the gods signify by hyparxis, power, and intellect. So hyparxis, power, and intellect turn out to be, therefore, in this system, the highest vision, which is the one, power, uh, limited, unlimited, and intellect being the triad. Or this, the hyparxis also is the summit of the nature of, of the highest point, the summit of, of the nature of anything in its fullest development. Power, next quote, power is with them, but intellect is from him, the Father. Right? Power is with them, the other two. The intellect is from the Father. The intelligible is food to that which understands. Right? That's man's nourishment. And you'll not apprehend it by an intellectual energy when you're understanding some particular thing. Now he's got a very nice one. It is not proper to understand, right? It is not proper to understand that intelligible with vehemence. No. But with the extended flame of an extended intellect, a flame which measures all things except that intelligible. But it is requisite to understand this. For if you incline your mind you will understand it, though not vehemently. It becomes you, therefore, bringing with you the pure convertible eye of the soul to extend the intellect to the intelligible, that you may learn its nature because it has a subsistence above intellect. And he says that Intellect must be void, must be empty of all other things. Eagerly urging itself towards the center of resounding light is the goal. 
In every world, a triad shines forth, of which the monad is the principle. That means for every triangle we make, there's always a principle that can, that can be given to that triad. That's the monad. The name that you give for the triad, that's the monad. The triad measures and bounds all things. going to go into the way in which he talks about these three minds. And in terms of the Kabbalah, of course, these are the corresponding terms for it. Um, It's really a different language, but it's the same terms. And um, I'll set them out here. Um, remember, everything, when it unpacks, becomes, an intel becomes a triad. So we're going to take the second, the intelligible, intellectual, which is the second, right? and that's going to have, that's going to be a triad. All of these can be a triad. So as we talked about it once before, if you can arrange all of this thought in this way, let's, let's, let me just show you that quickly. This is the summit. Alright, now, this is the basic source. Right. Often it must have the quality of a beingness. There's an overflow. That must be a vitality, a power. That vitality and power has a direction. Therefore, there must be, in some sense, some mind or intellect. Now, consider this in terms of divine luminosity, and then we can make, I think we can understand it better. In the encounter with that experience, it's not a light bulb, that's dead. Right? It just, it's dead. The light is nothing. It just it illuminates, but it, it has no power in itself. Or very low. This kind, therefore, this divine luminosity, does exist. It has existence. It is being. It is this, you can call it the highest being because involved in it, you can't conceive of anything being more real. Oh, it's got power. It's not dead. It's got power, vitality. It's not dumb because you recognize it as mind. Therefore, Another way of talking about that, therefore, is being, power, mind, divine luminosity. But now look here, you can also now do this. You can talk about just being in the sense of its ultimate reality. That has a summit. I mean, there's a certain power just to being. And being it doesn't lack intellect in itself. Hey, wait a minute. Power, it's not just power. Certainly, if it's power, there must be some existence to its power. 
And the power that it has is an extremely powerful, well, it's a powerful power. And it's not a dumb power. It's aware of itself. Therefore, it has others. Therefore, you can generate from each one of these another set. So therefore, we can express it this way as well. Mind has three. Intellect has three. You can keep proceeding. You can then fill this with manifestations of this basic triad or mean analogy. And the goal, if you want to understand this intellectually, is map it out. Map it out. Then all you have to do is keep those images, and then you understand it intuitively, and you can play with it on your own. So now we're dealing with this. That's going to be called the second, the second mind. Right? Well, uh, this is intellect. This is mind. Right? This is the substance of it. This is the power of it. This is the intellect itself functioning. All right. So that's the second mind, and we can then decide which one of these we want to accent as we explore it. That's all we'll have to do. Oh yes. Now. For, for the Chaldeans, they call this I-Y-N-G-S. Second Third Those are the names they give them. But don't worry about the names. They're going to function in the same way. We'll see how they function. Function the same way. Um, OK, I'll just quickly. Concerning the INGs, or the summit, INGs, or the summit, the top, the summit of the intelligible. And it's at the same time the intellectual order of the gods. Here, here it goes now. These being many ascend, leaping into the shining worlds that contain these three summits. One, two, three. All right, get in there. Jump into that. The Einges, the, right, which is the, the highest, the summit, they are the guardians of the works of the Father. Sinatris. But likewise, such as serve the material Sinatris. He gave them to guard the summits, mingling the proper force of his strength in the Sinatris. What did he do? He gave them to guard it by doing what? Mingling the force and the strength of the Sinatris. Isn't that what it should be? That's right. It should be the power and the vitality. Connectedly con containing all things in one summit of, of his high parks as the fullest flowering, according to the oracle, he himself subsists wholly beyond. So on top of all of this, beyond all these three, he sits, the, taking that together as a unity, above the three. In every world, a triad shines forth of which there is a monad as a principle. Or above it all, you can name each one of these, and that's called a monad. So I wanted to introduce you to uh, the oracle, but let me first, before I quit, get you a couple that I'm particularly fond of. Concerning Rhea, who in the intellectual triad is called Hecate by the Chaldeans. Now. Chronos, Zeus, Rhea. Look here. 
Kronos, Rhea, Zeus. And what is she called? Hecate and the Chaldeans. Hecate, right. The Vivic fountain of souls is comprehended under two intellects. Immense nature is suspended about the shoulders of the goddess. Right? Because she be, therefore she becomes nature. The power of nature, the overflowing of nature. The center of Hecate is carried in the middle of the fathers. This is the father, this is the father, this is the mother. Therefore, he's in the, she is in the middle of the two fathers. Kronos, this is uh, the wife of Kronos and the mother of Zeus. So he stands between two fathers, Ray or Hecate. Same system. The duad, remember the duad? The limited and the unlimited, that's the duad. Let me read. The duad sits with this God and glitters with intellectual sections together with the power of governing all things and placing in order everything which is not regularly disposed. Right? That's Zeus. Zeus is uh, characterized by the duad. Through the intellect he contains the intelligibles, but he introduces sense to the worlds, passing down into the material world those powers. The artificer, the demiurgos, who himself operating fabricated the world. He glitters, filled all things with love, the matrix containing all things. The union of this first father, Kronos, and the first of the unpolluted gods is transcendent, staple god, silent, and is said to consent with intellect and to be known by souls through the intellect alone. That's what I wanted to bring tonight, to show you that this is a very interesting system of oracles, ancient, worth reflecting on. It's in the same tradition. It was common to people as far over into Babylonia, Persia, all the way into Rome, Greece, common in that old world, especially Egypt, common also there. This was our heritage at one time, and I'm glad to see the stuff is now coming back again. Thank you. I think I got into it just in time, did I not? Now, let me give you a couple of books worth looking at. <clears throat> This comes from Thomas Taylor, Oracles and Mysteries is what I've been quoting from. This is another very good one, which connects it with the, I didn't have a chance to do this, I'm not uh, too much into the Kabbalah, I just know the names and how it functions. <clears throat> but it certainly seems to emerge right out of it, and therefore you can see it yourself. It's worth checking on. Uh, you see, it's interesting if, if the Kabbalah now is gaining a great deal of attention from people, yet it seems to come from the Chaldeans, you can match it up, and if the Chaldeans is part of the Neoplatonic tradition, wouldn't you expect the people who are here would jump here and here? But they don't. Not too many. Not too many. Let's hope more get into the game. Pierre, with the Chaldeans? Synonymous with the Magi? Hmm. I would like to. Uh, the Magi are Zoroastrian priests. And uh, 
the uh, the Magi had a long history and see the difficulty in answering your question is that the only evidence people have about this material is second century but it's already so well formulated and seems to have its roots doesn't it into this intellectual system of the Platonic that therefore it's echoing this or it's presenting it as an oracle and th see the real problem is that if we had all the literature, if we had all the philosophical literature, and we could print it here and make charts of it all around the walls, and have Proclus, the Neoplatonic tradition, the Egyptian mystery schools, the Gnostic systems, the Kabbalistic systems, the Chaldeans, etc., we would find so much similarity among them that we could then appreciate their differences. But it's like a whole tradition is moving through time, we're all moving together, and they had their differences. They had their differences. But overall, it was open to all men, mankind. So to answer your question, uh, I don't know, but I suspect it's the same group of people. And um, if you get into Q, you know, the... the what they call Q, the common material between Matthew and Luke in the New Testament, that goes back to wisdom tradition of the Greek Egypt of the of, of that period of time, mostly Greek and uh, influenced by Egyptian Greek thought, and that again is from the same the same period, same material. Thank you, thank you, thank you.